بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی سیدنا و نبینا محمد و علی آلہ و صحبہ اجمعین اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الا ان اولیاء اللہ لا خوف علیہم ولا هم یحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة صدق الله العظيم <coughs> My dear respected brothers and sisters who are listening firstly السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are here to discuss one great individual who has had passed away about two years from now and he was from this masjid from your local masjid and you are very very lucky people in Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't send people like that in the world except that he has very great favor to send people like this and many of us like the Imam said beforehand many of us haven't really benefited as we should have even myself I, I, I even think now I should have spent more time with him and I should have got more out of him. And it's only when somebody leaves the earth you think, Ya Allah, what a, what, a, what a loss. And to understand these people, you have to really get close to them. And even I didn't know what Allah Azza wa had given me as having the, the companionship of, of such an individual. Because I'm saying to you, I'm not saying, I'm not making this up, I'm not exaggerating. Allah Azza wa Jal has, I, I really think, one of the biggest walis of Allah Azza wa Jal in recent times to be in Britain was, you know, our Shaykh, our Ustazi, Mullah Fadr Rahim. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless his soul. May Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, give him the highest abode in Illiyin. And you don't have to be stingy. You can say, Ameen, loudly, because one, one day somebody will make dua for you as well like this. May Allah Azza wa Jal give, have a lot of mercy on Ustazji Mullah Fadr Rahim. May Allah have a lot of mercy on him. Say Ameen. May Allah raise his status in the dunya and the akhirah. May Allah give him the highest abode in Illiyin. Ameen. And may Allah Azza wa Jal resurrect him amongst the, the prophets, the siddiqeen, the shuhada, the salihin on the day of judgment. And may Allah Azza wa Jal take him with those straight to Jannah when they go to Jannah. Ameen. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give him Jannatul Firdaus. Now, who was this individual? And I'm not here to tell you about his whole life because I don't know about his whole life. Some people said to me, you know, am I going to speak about his whole life? No. I spent four close years with him. And those years were between 1993 to about 1997. Okay, Four close years I spent with him. And after that, I had many years where we wrote letters to each other. Uh, I was on the phone to him. I came and visited Oldham uh, several times and I spent time with him. And a lot of it was, you know, after the four close years with him, a lot of it was over the phone and through letters and, and other means. And of course, Alhamdulillah, I have to say later on as well, uh, I have had the opportunity that uh, Ustadji or Mullah Fadr Rahim, we used to call him Mullah Fadr Rahim and you call him Ustadji, wonderful names. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. He later on even uh, performed my nikah, so I, I had that opportunity. The whole process of even finding who I wanted to find and you know, having the nikah done and even after that. and f Forget, I will tell you a lot about you know, Ustadji. Today, obviously, Ustadji is not here and he used to hate anyone who would praise him. That's one great thing about it. If you ever praised him in front of his face, uh, his, his, his face would change. He never liked people to praise him. And if he found out that you're going to start talking big about him behind his back, he, he, he would not give you the same uh, closeness that he, he, he would give others. Because he didn't, he didn't want you to advertise him. And I had to be very careful throughout his life. Okay, And, and you, you probably noticed I've mentioned him a couple of times in my bayans here and there. Yes, but I've never actually given a bayan like this. I've never actually spoken about him and what I know of him. Never given a lecture like this. Why? Because I knew that if the moment he finds out, if he was alive, rahimahullah, if he finds out, then he's going to, he, it's going to hurt him to know that I have exposed, you know, whatever, Allah, whatever he did for Allah Azza wa Jal's sake. Because 
he was not only a scholar of the deen. Now you can find many scholars of the deen. Ulama, alim, alim is a scholar of the deen. Ulama are scholars of the deen. You'll find many of them. But to find a scholar of the deen who is amil, who practices what he, what he knows, is rare. And what's even rare than that to, is to find a scholar who's practicing the religion and who is mukhlis, who has ikhlas and sincerity at the same time. That, that is even rare. And what is even rare is to find an individual like that who's there to give everything he can to you if you're there to take what, what he's offering to you. And that's how Ustaz he was. That's how Mullah Fadr Rahim, uh, Rahimullah, that's how he was. So let me tell you how I came across him because I'm not going to tell you about his whole life. Okay? There are many people who can tell you about his whole life but I, I, I can't say that. So I was, a, I was an individual who went to Madrasa first at the age of 14. You know, I, I went to Dewsbury and I spent four years there. I did my hiv there. Uh, I mean, before that, let me tell you before that so that you can get an understanding of when I came to Mullah Fadr Rahim, uh, Rahimullah, when I came to him, what was my understanding? Okay? My, my understanding of the religion, I mean, I was a born Muslim um, and uh, some people even question me sometimes and say, you know, is he Shia? You know, Hassan Ali, you know, the name Hassan Ali, you know, they think, is he Shia? <laughs> because Hassan and Ali, right? I'm not a Shia, I'm a Sunni, alhamdulillah, born a Sunni. So, what happened is, uh, my whole early learning of Islam was through my father, rahimahullah. And my father was not an alim, he was not a scholar of the deen. Whatever he knew, he taught us in the house. And it was from my mother. My mother probably knew quite a lot more than my father in some regards. And she used to tell me whatever stories it is that she knew from her mother, from her father, because my, grand, my granddad, rahimahullah, he was a very pious man and he was a knowledgeable person, half of the Quran as well. So my mother used to give me a lot of the information of the deen and my father gave it and that's all I had. And then later on, I went to a local uh, masjid in, in, you know, I, I was born in Bortrev in, in Walsall next to, uh, you know, in Birmingham. And whatever I learned from my local maktab, my local masjid, that's all I knew. When I went to Dewsbury at the age of 14, I had to, re I had to check everything that I had learned up till then. Because now this is a real, real place of learning. So everything my mother told me, my father told me, my ustaz told me before that, everything had to be rechecked again. So I kind of went through, uh, you know, one of those, you know, sometimes when you go and you reboot your whole programming, yeah? And you, and you kind of, you know, override the information. So I rewrote a lot of the stuff that I learned beforehand. Okay, that was in Dewsbury. I did my hifz there. I memorized the Quran there. And then after that, I did some Arabic studies. And this was, so I went there in 1989 to Dewsbury. 1993, I came to Nottingham. Now, this is where I meet Ustad Ji. This is where I meet Mullah Fadr Rahim. So, I've given you a quick fast track of where I came from. And I'm going to give you bits more because you won't understand how Ustad Ji came across to me, Rahimahullah, if you don't understand where I came from. Okay? Because I was, you know, those of them who know me from Madrasa days, I wasn't your best student, if you know what I'm trying to say, like. Yeah? I was one of those cheeky students that would get up to whatever he could get up to. And I was very, very fortunate that I came across Mullah Fadr Rahim, Rahimullah. Why? Because in Dewsbury, where I studied, I mean, they had the knowledge there, don't get me wrong, they had the knowledge there. But what would happen is you leave the classroom, and after you leave the, leave the classroom, you're in the boarding section. And when you're in the boarding section, the only people that are supervising you are the supervisors. There's probably two supervisors on site. Uh, you got the whole place to yourself from about 3.30, 4 o'clock, you're free as students, all the way to 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock we had to come downstairs, all of us had to read together what we call takrar. It's like muraja, or you go over revision, or what you're doing, or you prepare for the next day's uh, lesson. So we used to do that till 8 o'clock. So that's the time when some teachers are there. After that, after 8 o'clock, you're free again. You go to your talk quarters, no one's there. Okay, It's just you and the students, and you have supervisors... Uh, that might be there now and again, and 11 o'clock bedtime, the supervisor will come out, get everyone to bed, and that's it, okay? Now, this dynamic completely changed in Nottingham. So, Nottingham, where, where in Nottingham? Well, this was in Flintham, okay? A46, uh, Newark, near Newark, uh, from about six miles near Newark, there was an RAF camp, uh, that ex-RAF camp site that had 120 rooms, okay? 
This place was derelict. It had, you know, it was, it was mashed up. No one was using it for years and years. Okay. And some of you might have even heard that my, some gin story, whatever I've shared with you from this place here. Yeah? You're laughing here. Yeah? So this was the place. Now, there was uh, an Ustad, Mullah Kamal, Rahimahullah. Okay. Say Rahimahullah. May Allah bless him as well. Honestly, every day I make dua. And I'm not joking here. Every day I try my best to make dua for including when I make parents, because my, both my parents have passed away. So I make dua for them fine. My father-in-law has passed away. I'll include him. But without forgetting the name, every day I make dua for Ustadji by name. And every day I make dua for Mala Kamal Rahimahullah. Right. Why? Because Mala Kamal Rahimahullah, he was the one who started the Nottingham Madrasa. And he was at Dewsbury first. He was the Imam there. A lot of people might might know him. He was the uh, you could say he was the best. I reckon one of the best teachers in the whole of the UK in Nahu and Sarf. No one, I don't think anyone would ever compete with Mullah Kamal Rahimahullah in Nahu and Sarf in grammar, the grammar and morphology. No one would compete with him. And his Arabic was like the Arabs. I mean, the Arab used to love him. Now he opened this place, he, he got this, he got this uh, derelict place, and at that time when we went there, there was only 25 students. Okay, so when I joined, there was about 25 students. First they started in Nottingham, in Madani Masjid, and then after that they moved over to this derelict place. And, and it, was, it was a very sort of a, a tattered place, you know, a place where there was no heating, we had to have, you know, small sort of uh, electric heaters, fan heaters, their place was freezing. You could put the heaters on all day. And these, these walls, subhanAllah, you know this building, it was bomb-proof. This building was RAF, you can imagine, right? It was bomb-proof. There was, you know, one wall was eight bricks. It was two bricks this way, two bricks that way, two bricks this way, and two bricks that way. How do we know? We had to drill through this, brother. <laughs> Not me personally, yeah? They had to drill through this. You know when you want to make a wall, yeah? It was crazy. Eight, eight bricks. And what happened is when they made four, two bricks, two bricks, two bricks, in between there's a gap. So even if a bomb fell um, and, it, and it blew four bricks away, it wouldn't be able to shatter the other four bricks of the inner part. So this was a humongous sort of building. It had three massive halls. It had a large sort of dining kitchen area. It had, um, it had 10.6 acres of land around it. And 10.6 acres of land was all like, you know, it was like a woody area. It, it was all, you know, um, to our fields, trees. Uh, and it was a lot of wildlife that, that, was, that was around there. A beautiful, serene place, middle of nowhere. The closest place, you know, when we had to go to town. Closest place to go to Nottingham town was 15 miles away. Okay, closest shop was probably about six miles away to Newark. Newark. So it was, it was in the middle of nowhere. But this was the beauty of it. Where the dynamic changed is... In Dewsbury, where I was, when I finished, you know, when we finished our studies, we were to ourselves. There was only supervisor looking after you. Here, there was a blessing. The blessing was, Mawlana Kamal Sahib Rahimahullah, Mawlana Fadr Rahim Sahib Rahimahullah, Sheikh Naeem, who's also in Oxford, who was there at the time. You know, may Allah bless him as well. He's, he's in Oxford still right now. He, all these teachers, Mawlana Abdul Haq Sahib Rahimahullah later on, all of them stayed on site. So Mullah Fadr Rahim Rahimullah, he had his own room. And his room was on the east wing block, upstairs. The farthest room was his, was his room. A beautiful small room. I would say his room was probably, you know, it's a very small room. I'm talking probably about, you know, six foot by six foot. Something like that. Right? Not more than that. Six foot by six foot was his room. And he had, in the corner, he had his mattress. All right, on one corner of he had his mattress. As soon as you walked in the room, on the left-hand side was his mattress. On the far side was his microwave oven. And on this side was all his books. And he had a window there and a musalla on the ground. And that's it. Okay, a very simple sort of room. Now, because the ustads were all on site, we had the opportunity to go and meet them and spend time with them. This was the brilliance of this. Because not many madrasas you will find that all your ustads, all, almost all your ustads are living on site. So you can go to them, go to this teacher, go to that teacher, you can benefit from them. And this is where I, I got to benefit from, from Ustadji, rahimahullah, because I came to Nottingham 
And you know, I was, you know, I just came in straight from Dewsbury. I thought, okay, new madrasa, I'm coming in here. I'm just going to study a few years, blah blah. Finish my course. And then somebody told me, they said, you know, amongst the amongst the teachers, we've got a wali of Allah. Now, you know, if you've heard of a wali of Allah, you would know what a wali of Allah is. Now, some of you, again, I'm saying this for the for the sake of the camera because this is going to go worldwide. Yeah, some people, you know, they find this all very dodgy, brother. Yeah, very dodgy. Yeah. Now, yes, there are many dodgy peer subs. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, there are many dodgy peers out there. Are many dodgy people who are faking it out there. Yes, yes, yes. There are people who will rip you for your money. There are people who just want to take something out of your pocket. There are people who will try and get the name and fame. But you know what? If you have not met someone like Ustadi Rahimahullah, you will not know what a true wali is. If you if you have not, because I really didn't know where I landed. Honestly, I didn't know because I came to the madrasa. And what happens is they say there's a wali of Allah. Now, all our lives, you know, most people, what they think of is peer sab means that, you know, if there's a wali or someone who's like a, what, what a wali is, is someone who's very close to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what it means, okay? So if someone's close to Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, you've got all these stories that go around, oh my God, they've got a turban this big, they've got a stick that big, you know, they're gonna, they're, they've got a frown on their face and, you know, all they're doing all day is, you know, they're saying a few words and everyone's scared of them and they're going, you know, it gets all this superstitious stuff out of them. No, 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 that's, that's not, that's not what it is. Please erase everything you know about this whole peer system and everything. Listen to who Mullah Fadr Rahim Sahib was and then open the doors of understanding who a true wali of Allah is. Okay? Because I didn't know any of this. I, I knew when I was young there was something called peer zarava and after that finished, you know, I came, I came here. So when I came to uh, Nottingham, I heard there's a wali of Allah here. I thought, okay, let me go meet him. So it's my first salah, I think it was Zuhr salah. I said to, after Salah, I said to the, to, to, to the colleagues, I said to them, I said, where's Mullah Fadr Rahim They said, he was just here. I said, where? So anyway, I said, okay, I'll wait for him because he's gone to his room. I'm not going to go to his room and disturb him. So I came all the way back, you know, I played around, whatever it was. And then Asr time came. Asr time, I prayed everything and I'm waiting. Where's Mullah Fadr Rahim Sahib? Rahim Allah, wait, wait, you know, where is he? So I'm excited. I'm waiting outside and everyone's sort of gone. And I said to colleagues, I said, where's Mullah Fadr Rahim they said, he just went by. I said, who, man? Who? You know, because I'm expecting, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm expecting a big, you know, sort of turban. I'm expecting some gigantic person. I'm expecting someone who, when he walks, everyone just stands by, you know? I'm expecting all these things. Because that's what you get used to when a, when a big peer or when some wali of Allah, or someone comes by, that's what you normally see. And they said, didn't you see him? I said, no. They said, it's that, you know, there was that person, gentleman who had, you know, who had a nice uh, um, uh, sort of overcoat, right? Half coat that, that he was wearing, and he had white beard. And I said, I saw a gentleman with white beard. Okay, fine, I'll catch him Maghrib time, right? So Maghrib came, and now I'm looking for an individual with white beard, and, and suddenly and then I, my eyes fell on him, okay? After Maghrib. And when I met him, I thought, what? Is this who they're talking about? Because if you met Ustadji, he was one of the simplest people you could, you could find. He was like your most ordinary person. He did not have any hoo-ha to him. None of this, like he's going to have 20 people behind him, walking on the entourage, none of that. He was approachable by anyone. You saw your local Musalli in the masjid, that's how Mullah Fadrin Sahib looked like. Okay? So how, was, how did he look like? I mean, you guys know, but for the sake of the audience. Okay? By the way, how many of you have met, met Ustadji? Put your hands up. How many of you didn't meet him? Put your hands up. Okay, there's a few people who never met him, so I'll, I'll explain to you. He wasn't too tall. I'd say about uh, five foot six or something. Five foot five, five foot six. That's how tall he was, which he, which is good average height. Uh, he had um, he had a very nice white complexion. He was from Sawat, from Pakistan, from MWFP of Pakistan, and the people from that region they have very fair skin, and some of them have very bright eyes as well. And, Mullah Fadr Rahim Sahib, Rahimullah, he had lovely grey eyes, okay, and he had, he had about, about six, I think, lines on his forehead, okay, he had a nice broad forehead with about good five, six lines going across there, which is really a sign of, of, a, of a thinker. Now, you might say to me, well, where do I know this from? I actually learned this from Mullah Fadr Rahim Sahib, Rahimullah, because he actually went through, you know, the things he taught me, I never learned from anybody else. He went through with me at one point, he went through all the human features. 
He says, someone has a nose like this, it means they're like this. Someone has teeth like this, it means like that. Someone has a neck like this, they're like this. Someone has a hand like this, like this. Someone walks like this, like this. Subhanallah al And he was, I mean, this, this stuff, I, I guess, how many of you in here in Pitt Street had the opportunity of hearing that from him? Put your hands up. Three people. I had close one-to-one, alhamdulillah. I didn't know where I landed, honestly. I didn't know. The amount I took off him in these four years, I would say, you know, I'm very, very fortunate. Wallahi alhamd. Many of you sitting here haven't been able to do that while staying with him in Oldham. Because what happened is, I got him trapped. Allah trapped him in the building in Nottingham. He couldn't go anywhere else, right? And Allah put me in the building. There's no, there's nothing. There's no town center nearby, yeah, to go to. So I was trapped. He was trapped. And Allah made the opportunity for me to spend time with him. So he was a lovely, you know, he had a lovely uh, nose with a, with a round sort of a, end uh, at, the, at the end, but he had a wedge, wedge in his nose. I've never seen anyone like that after him, but a lovely wedge on, on his nose. And he had a beard, I'd say, about like mine at this moment, and it was all sort of white. He kept himself very well, okay? He was very neat and tidy. He always presented himself very nicely. And he had the kind of hat he used to love wearing is the hat that you would find in the, in the, you know, northwest of sort of Pakistan kind of region, uh, which is a, which is a woolly sort of type, type of hat with, with the, with the part flat at, at the top. And he used to, a lot of the times he used to, he used to wear the kurta, the, the kameez and so on, up to his knees, below his knees. And he would wear a, a, a half coat a lot of the times. And he, he was, you know, he was, when he used to, Subhanallah al-Azim, when he used to smile or when he used to be, when he used to meet people, he used to really cheer you up. Now, the one thing about him, I have to say, Subhanallah al-Azim, was that this, some of the things Allah gave him, I never realized this, but later on I found out that not, I've only met one more person with this quality, nobody, nobody else in the world. Okay? Some of the qualities Allah gave Ustadji, I haven't met in all my travels except for one other person. That's my Shaykh in Bangladesh, Mufti Rashid Rahman. What's that quality I'm talking about? You know the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to be loved by everybody. You know you hear like Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says, oh he's the closest to Rasulullah sallallahu Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says he's the closest to him. Umar radiallahu anhu feels he's the closest to him. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu feels he's the closest to him. You know Sayyidina Jubair radiallahu anhu feels he's close to him. Everyone has got a story of how they are close to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everyone thinks that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam likes them uniquely some way that he doesn't like somebody else. Like he loves everybody. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam loves everybody, but he loves someone specially that he doesn't give that special love to anybody else. So for example, he was the closest and the most special to him in some special way. And we all had our stories. When we got together in the Doma, we used to talk to each other and we used to have stories. Like, Mullah Fadrim Sahib did this for me. And somebody else would say, oh, Mullah Fadrim Sahib, he did that for me. Somebody else would say, Mullah Fadrim did this for me. And everyone had a special love from Ustadji. Rahmullah, special love. Now, that is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi You will not find, you will not find in many people in the world. I've only met another one person I've only met another one person in my life. I'm telling you, that's my Ustad, uh, my Sheikh uh, Mufti Rashid Rahman uh, Farooq in, in Bangladesh with this quality that all the people around them have got stories that are close to him. Let me tell you another one. The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when you meet him, he makes you feel very positive and makes you feel happy and cheerful. No matter what is going in, in, the, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you met Ustadi Rahimullah, doesn't matter who you were, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what bad day Mulana is having, when you met him, he made you feel nice. He made you feel nice. And he not only made you feel nice, this was the normal thing for four years, every single day when I used to go and meet him. This was the normal case. So I'd go to his room and knock on his door. And he would say, straight away he would say, come in. Okay, so you, you walk inside. Mawlana Fadraim, Rahimullah, this is a Shaykhul Hadith. He's teaching Hadith of Bukhari and Tirmidhi in that same building. He's one of the top teachers of the place. His knowledge is like an ocean. 
his way of, you know, his character is something that everybody would love. And this is, I mean, he's, he's 70 years old. And this is what he does. To me, as a young individual, I was uh, 18 years old. When I joined his khidmah, I was 18 years old. Uh, when I would come to him, he would get up from his place in the room. He would stand up, come to the door. When opening the door, he would, he would allow me to come inside and he would greet me and he would embrace me. And when he would embrace me, first is his cheerful face. He would light up his whole face when I used to come to him. And I'm saying every day for four years, no, no, no difference, okay? I come, he's a, he would say, first thing he would say, he would say, Has, I say, he would say, he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then sometimes he would say, wa Some of you who know, he would say, wa I mean, And that's also in a narration as well, to say, wa maghfiratu. I mean, Allah give you his forgiveness as well. So when he would say that, he would, he would grab hold of me and he said, Hasanun This was the phrase he made for me. Every person in the madrasa had, almost every person who was close to him had a different phrase, different way he would approach them. So my one was, Hasanun walam yara mithlahul aynani. Hasan, the one that two eyes, no two eyes have ever seen the likes of. Okay? This was a phrase from a poem. Somewhere, some poem, he, he used to say that poem every time he used to meet me. His face very cheerful, his, his teeth are beaming with delight on seeing me. And then he would grab hold of me and then he would give me a good squeeze tight. Good, you know, tight squeeze. And then he would do this. He would not let go of me until he gave me four du'as. And every time he would try and change his different du'as when he, when he met me. Okay. So now he's holding on to me. Imagine he's holding on to me. He's squeezing me tight. At the same time, he's saying, May Allah give my Hassan ilm and knowledge. May Allah give my Hassan good practice. May Allah make him shine over the world. May Allah make him a great person. And after he would give me four du'as, then he would release me and he would, he would then say, Beto, sit down. Right? Now, if you wanted to get up to Nana Hazrat, please, I want to. I want to sort of go and uh, I, I want to get something for you. No, no, no. He would say, Beto, sit down. So I sit down. What he would do, he would now speak to me nicely. You know, with all the lovely, as, as he's moving around the room, six, six foot by six foot room, not too big. He's moving around the room and he's trying to get tea ready. So he'll, he's got a whole tea place there. He makes tea, warms it up in the microwave. He's making two cups. As he's making the two cups, he's still talking to me. Mera Hassan, kaise ho? My Hassan, how are you? Mera Hassan, khariyat se. My Hassan, are you okay? My Hassan, mosam bada icha hai. He would say that the, the weather is very good. And he would, he would speak, speak, speak. Keep me entertained as he's making two cups of tea. He would not allow me to get up and touch the cups of tea. He would make them. 70 year old man, he makes two cups of tea. He lays the, the dastakhan or the little mat in front of me. He puts one cup in front of me. He puts one cup in front of himself. He sits down. And then as he takes the cup of tea to his mouth, he says, Ab batao mere piyare hasan, mein aap ki khidmat kya kar sakta hoon? Now tell me, my beloved hasan, what service can I be of you? Now you feel, you might feel, okay, this is a man, Rahimullah, doing it one day. This was not one day. This was almost every time I would go and see him, this was his way of, of greeting me. So I would sit with him, I would say to him, uh, I would say, Monana, I've got uh, two two questions. Do swal hai. He would say, Do ne, das pucho. Don't ask me two questions. Ask me ten. Now, when I say he says to me, ask me ten. I'm not making this up. I've never met a ustad in my life. I've had several. I've probably had about 40, 50 ustad. By the time from my beginning till the end. I probably had about 40, 50 teachers that have taught me different lessons, different places, okay? I've never met in my life a person who was so open for you to ask questions. And not only that, you could ask the silliest question ever on the earth and he would still smile and give you an answer. He never made you feel like, you know, what kind of, what kind of question was that? Never, never. You know how many questions I ended up going to him with? I had an A4 pad, okay? A lined A4 pad. And during 24 hours, I started to think about my questions. And you know what I said to you? When I went to Dewsbury, I erased my knowledge that my mother and my father, my ustaz before gave to me because I didn't know what was right and what was wrong. Okay? Some of the things they taught me, alhamdulillah, was brilliant. But some of the things they taught me was not to think. So in Dewsbury, I erased it and I got it all right. 
And then when I met Mona Fadilim, when I saw his level of knowledge, I put everything. So my mother's knowledge, my dad's knowledge, my ustad's knowledge, my whole of Dewsbury four years knowledge, everything they taught me all together. And I started to take it through the process of Mona Fadilim's knowledge. And I started to erase and chop and ch- chop and chair whatever I could. All right. And the thing was that A4 pad, I don't know how many pads I finished. Every day in 24 hours, I would write as many questions I could think of. I could even remember till today, I've got some, some of this at home. 28 questions on one side of A4 paper, 28 questions, right? I would write them all down, 24 hours. My time is again there, 4 o'clock, when all the kids used to go and play. This was, this was the fortune Allah gave me. The other children used to love playing football. And they used to love roaming around, playing in the acres of land and all that. I wasn't into football. Even till today, I'm not into football. And I say, Alhamdulillah. Yeah? Alhamdulillah. If you like football, Alhamdulillah. If you don't like it like me, Alhamdulillah. Okay? So let's not have a war about it. So what happened is, they used to play football and they used to play other games, cricket sometimes, other things. And I used to just go to study. And I used to spend the full two hours from four o'clock to six o'clock full, taking every benefit I could from him. And those questions of the whole A4 paper, I used to go and sit with him. And I used to say, Hazrat, I said, I've got some questions. He goes, oh, ask me more, ask me more, ask me more. Whole two hours gone. Every other day, every day, if I could, unless some mehman came, sometimes some guests came. When the guests came, then I stopped and he gave the time to the guests. When the guests went, then we carried on and we carried on talking. And you know what? He gave me time like no other student in the madrasa. And these are not my words. He said it himself. By the end of the four years, the third year and the fourth year, he said to me, he said, Hassan, he said, I've given you more time than anybody else. But he said to me, there's a, there's a price to pay. Okay? Now, Hazrat Ji, mashallah, never in his life ever asked for money. I knew him for how long? He passed away in 2015, rahimahullah. I met him in 1993. So this is 22 years I knew him. In 22 years, not one day ever he asked me for something. That's a wali of Allah. That's a real wali of Allah. All those people listen to this. If you want to go back and check your peer salves and everything else, you want to go and see what this individual was, rahimahullah, because this was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Have you ever seen in any hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asking Sahaba, give me this? Have you ever read a hadith like that? No. If he ever took something, he borrowed it. In the whole of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he needed money, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needed money, he borrowed something. Sometimes he borrowed from Jewish people, but he gave it back. Every penny he owed to someone before his death, he paid it all back. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nowhere in any hadith you will find that he taught the Sahaba, he did favors for the Sahaba, and he expected the Sahaba to do something for him. Never. And this sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, in all the awliya of Allah in the world, I know there are many, plenty of wonderful awliya across the world. I'm not putting anybody down. But to meet someone like this, 22 years I knew him, never ever asked me for a penny, never asked me for a service. The only thing he asked me was this. Four years he gave me and he kept on saying this throughout the end of his fourth year. He said, Hassan, I've given you a lot of time. More than anyone else. And then he said this. He said, He said, because you're going to have to one day give it to the whole of the world. Now some things he said, I never understood. I really never understood what he was actually saying. But today I understand. He said, to me again and again he said Hassan I've given you so much time but there are gonna be, there's going to be a time when a lot of people will come to you don't turn anyone away this is his wasiya his, his thing will to me don't turn anyone away he said if people come to you for help you have to help them just like I helped you and he said you will find a lot of people that will come to you and I didn't understand, like today, Alhamdulillah, you know, I go all over the world and I, and I lecture, but I never knew what he was talking about then. In fact, when he passed away, Rahimahullah, I've got about 25 letters, 20 to 25 letters at home that are personal letters from him he sent to me. And there are about 25 letters probably I sent to him 
This was after I finished the four years and I traveled on to Bangladesh. And even when I became imam, I used to write to him and he used to write back to me. Because those days, there was no mobile phones or anything. So we, we had this beautiful way of writing a letter to him. He used to write back to me. And after his death, rahimullah, I opened these letters one by one. And honestly, I was crying. I was crying just, list, just, just reading his letters. And, the way, and he had beautiful handwriting. Those of you who know him had wonderful handwriting. And in that, I found certain things, subhanAllah, I'm going to say to you one thing. He said in those letters, I never understood in 1997 he wrote this. This is 20 years ago from today. He said to me, Hassan, you're going to go through this phase in your life later on. And I never opened that letter for 20 years. I opened it again after 20 years. Okay? First time I opened it in 1997, I never understood what he was writing to me. But in 2015, I understood what he meant. He said, you're going to go through this phase in your life. And he said, don't worry about things. You're going to have these people and whatever after saying this. He said, don't worry about that. He said, and he wrote there in his letter, he said, Mujay yaqeen hai. He said, Allah Ta'ala, he said, he said, I have full conviction from Allah Azza wa Jal that he will, he said, through, he said, his knowledge. And I'm not, I'm not bigging myself up here. Honestly, I'm only saying this out of the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I'm sure there are many of his students who are spreading knowledge across the world. But he said this to me. And he said this while he was alive in the mother's side. He said this later on. And in that letter he said also, he said, through me there's going to, he said, my knowledge will spread through you. If you have heard my bayans, most of what I say is from Mullah Fadrim sir. So if you ever wonder, well, how do I speak like that? And how the kind of stuff that I say in my bayans... Most of the stuff that I say in my bayans is from Mullah Fadrin Sahib because I spent four close years every day. I was in his room and I was just listening to him and I was question after question after question. And he never said no to a single question. Once I saw this dream in year 2001, I saw he gave me seven bottles of atar, seven bottles of perfume he gave to me. And he had it on a shelf and he offered it to me and he said, this is yours. He gave it to me one by one. And I took it from him, and then I woke up, and then I phoned Mullah Fadrin Sahib. This was another part of him, subhanAllah, his dream, dream interpretation. Those of you who've gone to him for dream interpretation, he was spot on. Okay, So he said to me, this was in 2001. By this time, I hadn't even got, traveled the world to do my talk. He said, through me, he said, my knowledge will spread through you, and it will go across the world. And he said one thing uh, when, when I was in, in Nottingham with him, and I kept on saying, I said, Hazrat, please make dua. He said to me, said, I made a lot of dua for you. I've given you a lot of dua. But he said, one condition you need, Hassan. He said, you need to be humble. He said, the more humble you become, the more Allah will lift you up. And this was one thing that Mullah, Mullah Fadr Rahim had. He was very, very, very extremely humble. To the extent, he said this to me. I was with him in the room and he said to me, he said, Hassan, he said, agar ab iswak. He said, if right now, if an Ethiopian slave who is, you know, who has no regards in the world, he's a slave, he's Ethiopian, he comes, walks in this door right now, and he takes hold of me, puts me on the ground, and he puts his sole of his foot on my neck, and he stamps on me on the ground, he said, Me hilungani. He said, I will not even move. He said, if he keeps me like this for two hours on the ground, he said, I will not say anything to him. And why he was saying this to me was to make me understand the level of tawadu or humbleness that not only he had, but he was trying to pass on to me. And he kept on saying to me again and again, he said, the more humble you will become, the more Allah will lift you. And he said, this is the secret of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is, man tawadu alillahi rafa'u Allah. Whosoever is humble for the sake of Allah, Allah Azza wa Jalla will lift him. Now, Mullah Fadr said, what I said to you was that I'm going to him every single day and I'm asking him questions. The more I ask him, the more I ask him, the more happy he becomes. You know how happy he became? He started to mention to the other teachers, he said that I'm so happy that Hassan is coming to me and asking me questions. Now, you don't get this normally. I'm telling you, you're going, you're going to ask somebody 28 questions a day. They'll be like, oh, he's here again. Let me go. You know, he's coming again. Mona used to wait for me. And when I came, he used to be so happy. He used to, you know, hug me again, make me sit down. 
I need to answer the question. Now, you know when I say I ask the questions, you know what kind of questions? You're thinking, subhanallah, these are all religious questions. No, 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 no. You ask religious questions, worldly questions, you ask questions of the ocean, questions of the land, you ask questions of the seen and the unseen, you ask questions of humans, of jinns, you ask questions of planet earth and space and sky, everything he will answer. To the extent that sometimes I'm saying this, I'll just break it up to you because I know there's some young kids here, yeah? I could remember having with Morana two to three hours a time a session on what a man should do on his first night when he gets married. You guys understand that you're like, Ugh. I don't know how many of you in, in, in Oldham are able to like have that, had that opportunity. No, I had, I'm going to repeat it for you. Right down to the private things of a man and a wife, everything, Moana is telling me full, top, bottom, in, out, everything. I can't go further because there's young kids here. You don't understand, guys? Yeah, guys, do you understand or not? Everything. And Moana would say, you do, and even the treatment of how one should treat their wife and what they should do, what they should not do, everything. You open up and he's a treasure. He'll bring it out. To the extent of space, I mean, subhanAllah, we're talking about space. Seriously. We're talking about planets. We're talking about wasama'i dhatil buruj. We're talking about the ayah dhatil buruj. We're talking about which planet, mirrikh, and he'll tell you this. And half the times I'm lost. <laughs> I'm like, wow. He's talking about planets. He's talking about which planet is where. He's talking about the moon and the cycle of the moon. He's talking about how they, you know, and what times is really good when Allah Azza wa Jal does certain things to the weather and, and what time, then he'll move on to things like dua times and what nights are special and you know, you, you're sitting there and you're just listening and half the things are probably not going in my head because they're, they're above me. But you know, you talk about maths. He'll give you a good lesson on maths. Seriously, uh, you, you might think, I don't know how many of you know them have ever come. He'll, he'll, his sums in maths will baffle, and they baffled me. I couldn't even do some of the sums. He'll talk about that. He'll poetry. Talk about poetry. He'll go on and on and on. Hours. Talk about poetry. This poem, that poem. In fact, he told me once he was, you know, he had many, many parts in his life when he used to teach different, um, different individuals. And once he was in a school in Pakistan, he used to go with the cycle. He told me he used to go to the school and he said to me, he said, uh, in that school, there was a library of a good few hundred books. The library, you know, normally in a school, you have a library. You know what Molana did? Molana read every single book in the library. Molana read every single book in the library, he told me this, and that's how he had a wealth of information. If he found something, he would read it. And most people wouldn't even know that there's, there's this uh, whole mine, you know, inside him. The, di the deeper you dig, the more you find. Talk about tafsir, he will tell you. Hadith, he will tell you. Talk about fiqh, he will tell you. Talk about normal life, he will tell you. Sociology, he will tell you. Psychology, he will tell you. He was a, he was a very good, uh, he was a very good hakim. Those of you who know, he used to deal with some leaves, herbs, and medicines. That's what a hakim is. And he would give people treatment through the herbs. Not only that, but he was wonderful in psychology. I'm not talking about a psychology degree here. But what I'm saying is nafsiyat. He used to call it ilmun nafsiyat. The knowledge of a person's psyche, he would be able to tell that all he needed to do is this. I don't know if you've ever seen him do this. He'll take the patient, he'll put his uh, thumb onto, his, onto the patient's uh, vein. He'll put his thumb there. And he just, just take the heartbeat for a little while. And then he would tell the person what's wrong with the liver, what's wrong with the heart or even the stomach or something else or brain or whatever. He would say it like that. Allah gave that knowledge. How many of you in Oldham knew that? Put your hands up. Okay, few, mashallah. How many of you knew that he used to see jinns walking in the day? Put your hands up. There's a few. Mashallah, good. Right? When he came first to Nottingham, he didn't realize that he's given this information out. Right? And the children, when they heard it, you know, everyone was like, whoa, what was that? Because Mullah Fadriza, he came in and he started to make a, he just made a statement. He said, oh, I can see some jinns walking around here. He just made a statement. He didn't realize that these are children and they're all going to be coming for ghost stories later on. Right? He never knew that. So he just said it, blurted it out. And then after that, he had to stop. He said he saw Christian jinns walking, a lot of the Christians. And he, he even said the months they were coming in, the months they were not coming in, he said that. He said that the month of Safar in, in, in uh, the Arabic second month of the, of the year. He said that's the month they used to come. 
And he, he would even explain that they came with a whole caravan and they would stay in, in, in another part of the wing of the whole of the madrasa. And he even saw their kids. He, would describe, he told me personally, he said, they've got to come with a little kid and so on. And that kid sometimes comes on this side to our children on this side. He would explain this. But you know, Morana, he would not open up to anybody about this stuff. He would not open up. When he realized that children are talking about this, he stopped. He completely stopped. He never gave anything out. But those who got close to Molana, then he would open up to you. It took me nine months to open him. Because the first nine months, I was asking questions, after questions, after questions. He's giving the answers, but he's not opening his insight to me. He had a wealth of information. One of the greatest things he had was the firasa. Molana, Father Imsah, Rahimullah, Yustadji, Rahimullah, when he just saw you, he knew... He knew, he could read your mind. Put it this way, he read your mind straight. When he just saw you, he read your mind. When students found this out, some students were scared to even look him in the eye. I'm not making this up. Because this is what Mona would do, okay? Imagine this, okay? Fajr time comes. Now what, what does, what, where's Monana been all night? Doesn't matter what time Monana go to, goes to sleep, he's up two o'clock, bang on, without an alarm clock. Two o'clock by the dot. You can stand in the corridor. Mona will open his door and he will come down the corridor. He'll do his wudu, use his miswak. He'll use the you know, toilet there. Do, use miswak, do wudu and go straight to his room. And then he will start his tahajjud. Okay? From two o'clock till fajr, he's doing tahajjud, dhikr of Allah. And he's just making dua to Allah for three hours non-stop. Okay? So I'll tell you a bit about that a bit more later on. But Maulana would come from, straight from the, his, his room near Fajr time, he would come all the way to the masjid area, we had a hole there, we made it our masjid area, and he would be sit in the front line. So he's got his back towards everybody, he does not see who comes in the masjid. When the iqama starts, he prays with everyone, when he's finished, he makes dua with everyone, and Maulana turns down like everyone else, and he just goes straight towards his room. He has not turned around... Now, most people would have left or something, or half the people have left. He don't know how, or he doesn't know how many, how many people have actually come or not come. Mawlana goes to his room, rahimullah. Then he comes down at about 7.45. This is about 15 minutes before the lesson is starting at 8 o'clock. Sometimes 15 minutes before, sometimes 10 minutes before. He's standing in the corridor, and he just stands there, and he says, salam to the students, okay? And students are coming, salam alaikum. The students are getting ready now. They've had their breakfast, they're getting ready now. And as the students say salam to him, those of them that prayed Fajr, he would say Salam and find their God. Those of them that didn't pray Fajr, he would hold the hand, pull him to himself, whisper in the ear, go and pray your Fajr. Now you telling me yeah, that this person has got some register, no register. No way of knowing this. And any student that has missed his Fajr in the morning, he knew, you come across Monana, he will whisper in your ear. And nobody else knew this, he would say, Jakar Fajr Parlena. He would say in a nice way. He would not embarrass you. He would say, now, Jakar Fajr Parlera. Pallo, pallo. Go and pray, go and pray. Right? And, and the thing was, he would never get this wrong. In four years, I know, I mean, he wouldn't do this every day, obviously, but whenever he could, he would tell someone. Now, when he, when he got into the lesson, sometimes he went off on a tangent in the lesson. And he would say things, you know, off the tangent. And you see, now, you, wonderful stuff, like a bayan he started. After the lesson, Somebody there, one of your colleagues will say, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, that was all about me. After he's gone out, one of the students says, Ya Allah, he talked about me today. Sometimes they wouldn't say anything. Sometimes the student would die in shame. Later on, that student will go straight to his room and say, Hazrat, Hazrat, you talked about me in the lesson. Right? And Mullah will say, No, what do you mean I talked about you in the lesson? What do you mean I talked about you in the lesson? He said, Look, Mullah, whatever you said in the lesson, it was directed to me. Then Mullah would say, Look, just do your tawbah. Do your tawbah, repent to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now, this is not common that Allah Azza wa Jalla gives this kind of firasa to anyone. And he wouldn't open up, like he would never embarrass anyone. When he had to tell you that like, you've done something wrong, he would never embarrass you. In fact, when I would come from the holidays, if I did good, like this, look, imagine, right? I've spent seven days, I've gone from Nottingham to Walsall, I've spent seven days, Monana was not there, after seven days I come back. First meeting with Hazrat. Go straight in his room. Assalamu alaikum. Maybe I bought something. He used to love, he used to love the Bengalis in the madrasa. He used to, they, they used to love fish and he used to love fish as well. And he used to love the moment when Bengalis used to come and, you know, bring fish and other things for him. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. If you never bought it for him, don't worry. You wouldn't get a telling off, okay? 
So um, bring him something from home, give him the, the fish that he likes, and then we'll come into his room when he would meet me. If I did something good in the holidays, he, this is after I get close to him. He would not do this with all the students. If I, if I did something good in the holidays, he would comment on it. And if I did something bad in the holidays, he would comment on it. Straight away. Straight away. You just come in his gathering straight away. Once I remember, subhanAllah, this act, I'm just telling you this. I'm not in the act of doing this right now, but I could ask that, subhanAllah, how Allah has given Mulana Firasa. And a Firasa is when you know the inner, inner th- part of a person. Allah just gives you this quality that you can just read it. You can just read inside people's hearts. Once I remember in the holidays, I just, you know, I, I started to get up for tahajjud and I started to read some long rakats. Because, I, you know, I wanted to read certain juz or whatever in the rakats. And I'm only telling you this because Mawlana, he commented, and the way he commented, I thought, Ya Allah, what firas Allah has given Mawlana. I came and I met him and he's, and he's turned around to me and he said, after a few days, he said, you know, he said, you know that salah that you started in the holiday time? He said, you know that salah that you started in the holiday time, you're not doing it now. Allah Azza wa Jal used to love that very much. And it's like, nobody knew of this. No one, not one human being would not even my dad knew about this. And then he would add on, he would say, he would, he would even comment on how to get khushu inside the salah. And he would tell me, he said, Hassan, when you get into your, into your sujood, Try and think like this. And he gave me in every part of salah something to think about to, to gain my khushu in salah. Now, this is not, I'm going to get into the khushu and I'm going to get into the, the actual prayer itself. Now think about this here. I went to Molana and I got every single part of my, my salah part done through Molana again. What I mean by this is, is that I went to his room and he taught me the full salah again. I'm 18 years old. And I've been praying all my life, like from, from 12, whatever, I've been praying, that's fine. But when he, when I went to him, and I actually asked him, not that he, he wanted to do this to me, no. I said, Monana, I want to I wanna go through everything with you. Tell me, teach me how to pray salah. And he was so happy, so happy. He commented on other, to other ustad that Hassan has actually come to me to learn his salah. And I'm going to tell you this, right? I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to make you do it. He made me do every single part of it, and he perfected it with me. Right? So, you want to turn your camera, I don't know which way. Okay, so, he would, and I'm going to tell you simply, okay, he said, first, your feet, both of them should be facing the Qibla straight. Some people have them like this, outwards. He said, that's wrong. Because in the Hadith, it's that your feet should be towards the Qibla straight. There should be a slight gap between the, between your feet. Then he would say that when you raise your hands, you raise your hands like this. And he showed me exactly like this, where you have your hands directly towards the Qibla. These fingers are together. These thumbs are loose. And they are to the level of the earlobes. And he made me practice this again and again. Some of you are going to say, oh yeah, that's so easy. No, you do. You'll be doing this. And some people will be doing this. And all sorts of things, okay? It takes a lot of time. Away, this way. And all fingers straight. Fingers joined together. These thumbs loose. Okay? And you have it there. Then when you try your hands, you try it like a little watch around where you, where you put the thumb here. The, the little finger goes down there, three fingers straight there, put it where your belly button is, just below your belly button. And then he would teach me in every part, he told me something to gain khushu. He said, when you stand, when you stand, think about Maliki Yomiddin, which is you're going back to Allah Azza wa on the Day of Judgment. And you're standing there right now. When you look down to your sujood place, that's your qabr, that's your grave. So that's where you stand. And then he would teach me to pray slowly. And when he went to Ruku, he told me a number of combinations. And most people get this wrong. To do the Ruku properly. And I had to practice this with him quite a bit to get it right. Number one, he said, when you go down Ruku, your palms have to be on your kneecaps. Okay? Kneecaps. Number two, he said, your, your fingers have to be spread. That's fine. Number three, he said, he said, lock your legs. Number four, he said, lock your arms. Number five, and this is the most difficult part, I'm going to turn around a bit to show you this. You, you put your palms on your, on your kneecaps, you put your hands webbed, you've locked your arms, you've locked your legs, and most people don't do this. Watch this. You have to go, can you see that now? Yeah? See, if you don't move forward, like I was normally here, okay? If you don't move forward 
and you know your heels, the muscles there, if you don't make yourself go forward like that, and that's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu then you won't get a straight back. And then the last one is your head. It shouldn't be tilted down. It shouldn't be tilted up. It should be just straight. And when you have that, you know Molana, he used to stay in this ruku for 20 minutes ago in tahajjud. I'm there with him and my knees are shaking. Because I went and joined him in tahajjud. I really, I really uh, begged him and I, and I got that. But anyway, this is ruku. And this is the sunnah way of doing ruku. Some people think to get the straight back, you have to bend your legs. He said, that's wrong. You have to lock your legs straight, but you have to move yourself forward. And that, that muscle at the calf muscle will stretch slightly, but that's, that's when you get the full black straight. Okay? And then he says, Sami Allah, he said, this, the, the hands have to be to the side. And when you go down, he had a wonderful way, he told me, the going down. When you go down, he said, the back has to remain straight. Now this takes a lot of practice. Look, when I go down, look, knees bend, back is straight, back is straight, back is straight. Now where are my hands going to be? He said the hands have to slowly, slowly move in towards the kneecaps and towards the end of the thighs as you come down. Okay? Now you see my back hasn't bent at all. And then he said the knees down first. Okay, then your hands down. Now when your hands are in sujood, this is the position. Locked fingers straight towards the qibla. Two thumbs out, nose goes between these two thumbs here, okay, and the forehead here. So he said you make an arch with these two thumbs and the nose goes right in between the two. And that's how you're going to sujood with your, obviously, your, your elbows up and your feet on the ground. Again, the toes have to be facing the qibla. A lot of practice has to be done for this because when you come back up from the, from the sujood, when you come back up, you have to come back up. The sunnah is you come back up and you have to come back up with a straight back. Right? Straight back going down and straight back going up. All your thigh muscles are going to be really locked in to try and get that. Most people just go straight in like that, ruku and all the other, you know, business that they have going ruku. And then tahiyya position, you're sitting down. And what Molana used to do, I don't know if you realize. When Molana used to sit in tahiyya, I have never been able to do that. I've never met anyone else who's been able to do that. He used to not only put his right foot up with his toes towards the qibla, he used to bend his left foot toes towards the Qibla as well. He had both of the toes, both feet toes towards the Qibla. How many of you have seen that? Monana used to do that. He had both of them towards that. And the thing about Monana in his salah was he did not used to move. That's another sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When he used to be engaged in his salah, he used to be engaged in his salah. And he had a wonderful khushu, a wonderful way of now... Uh, let me tell you this. He said to me, okay, when you stand, you look at the, you, you're looking at your grave. When you're in your ruku, he said, look at your, look down. And he said, think, when Malakul Maut will come, it will take you first from the feet. Okay? He said, when you go into sujood, look at the end of your nose. Okay? Because when you go in your grave, the first thing that's going to deteriorate is going to be your nose. And when you sit in tahiyya, in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, then think, you're just, and throughout the salah he said, this whole salah is about showing that you are no one in front of Allah. You are no one in front of Allah. Now, again and again, Khushu, he used to have lessons in things, you know, what he, was, what he used to tell me. And Mawlana, rahimahullah, in asking him these questions, he had no limits whatsoever of what he would, he would, he would expect from me. What he would expect from me. I know there's a couple of minutes left for the adhan, I'll, I'll give you time for that. That's it, 40 is the salah, so we've got about three minutes left. Let me tell you one, one other uh, part of Molana, and then you, you, you can have a break, inshallah, Maghrib, and we'll have to carry on after Maghrib, because I've got a lot to tell you. I've only just started. I, I don't know how long I'll be able to get it all in, what I'll be able to get in before Isha, but I will try my best to get whatever I can in. So what happens is, this, this, I just want you to listen to this, uh, this uh, part, this story, and then, and then we'll have the adhan of Maghrib. Your muadhin's not going to give the adhan till I finish, right, Molana? Your muadhin's okay, tell him please, yeah? I don't want the adhan in between. One night, I was in the madrasa, and I, I woke up in the night time, at 2 o'clock. Okay, so this is just, as I think by this time, there's only about 60 students in the whole madrasa. I woke up in the night, I'm in a room with six other students, we're all sleeping in there. Two o'clock I woke up and 
it was all dark. There was only a bit of light that was coming in from the lamp that was outside of the room because there's some street lamps. Not, they couldn't call them street lamps. There were lamps within the compound that were there and some of the light used to come inside the building. Yellowish kind of, you know, amber kind of light that used to come in. So I woke up at 2 o'clock in the night and I heard La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. La. And it was, it was not one person saying this, this was a whole group, group of so many saying it. And I just woke up and I'm thinking, no one in the room is saying it. No one in the building is saying it. I can hear this coming from outside of the, of the room, you know, outside the window. So what I did is I slowly put my head up. And I looked through the window and I did not see a single person. The whole place had leaves. It had the wind blowing gently. Um, I could see through all the way to the courts of the tennis courts. I could see all the way across to Monana's room on the corner. But nobody was there. But I'm hearing very loud. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Good two, three minutes I heard it. I looked through the window and then I went back to my place again and I slept and the next day Fajr time because I used to go and uh, serve Monona uh, breakfast at Fajr time that was another time I used to go to him as well so I went to him Fajr time and I served him the breakfast and I said Monona I said something strange yesterday I said I couldn't see anyone neither in the building nor outside the building I looked all around but I said I heard this dhikr yesterday so I said to Monona I said I said uh, I heard this la ilaha illallah after Fajr when I served him and Monana said to me, he said, he said, oh, he said, so, so you heard that? And I said, Monana, I said, what was it? What did I, what did I, there was no one there. He said to me, don't worry, you won't hear it again. And I said to Monana, please tell me, what was it? You know, I, I want to know, what did I hear? Was it, was it, I don't know what it was. I couldn't see anyone. He said, don't worry, you won't, you won't hear it again. Now, I never understood this, but when he passed away, rahimahullah, I related this to my sheikh in Bangladesh, Mufti Rashid Rahim Farooq. And Mufti Sahib said to me, my sheikh said to me, he said, ah, he said, Allahu Akbar. He said, that means he used to teach jinns how to do dhikr in the night. That was a whole group of jinns. I never realized at that time. It was a whole group of jinns outside, all coming from his room outside. They were all gathered together in the night. And Mawlana is giving them ta'aleem and he's giving them instructions of dhikr. In fact, I'm going to tell you stories about him Teaching jinns after the Maghrib Salah, I want you to, t I want you to stay. As soon as I come back on, I'm going to tell you how he used to t teach jinns. You know, specifically one to one, he used to teach jinns, inshallah. So let's have the Maghrib break now, inshallah, and we'll carry on after that. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I told you about Hazrat and he had, a, he had, not only was his ta'aleem and his instruction coming to uh, the human beings, but also to jinns. And Allah gave this very special quality to him. And I'm not making this up. I mean, he used to, he used to teach uh, jinns even here on Pitt Street. Pitt Street, here. He used to teach jinns. You might be smiling at me thinking how. His son is here right in front of me. Ahmed Ali, I've had a conversation with him. And he said, this is his son, Ahmed Ali, who's right in front of me now. So many times, he, one o'clock in the night, you know, there's somebody in the house that is talking to Ustadji. You know, Ustadji had a lot of, lot of guests that used to come to him. And no guests used to be refused. If somebody came to him, they came to him. He would serve whoever he could. Um, and I just want to say on that note as well, again, his son, Ahmed Ali, narrated this to me, uh, that once... Uh, there was a few guests coming to, to see them, about three different guests coming to see them. And there was Monana in the house, Ahmed Ali was in the house. In fact, you know, things are coming in my head. Let me just tell you another story, then I'll tell you this one and the other one, right? He said to me, once he went to a dinner, and uh, the, the person in the house, they said, it was him and another, another uh, Monana that went to the, to the house. And when they went, they were surprised because the woman bought the food. The woman bought the food to them. So she, she bought the food to them, the roti, everything else, and they ate. And after they finished eating, and the woman just bought it and she went away. Okay. So after they finished eating, the Monana said to Ustadji, he said, Ustadji said, you know that woman, he said, uh, she had one eye that was slightly out of place. And Monana Fadrahim Sahib, Ustadji, he said, 
He said, I never looked at the woman. He said, I never even looked at the woman. I never even raised my eyes to look at the woman. Now, obviously, the other person is going to feel embarrassed. But Molana told me this story. Why? Because he said he doesn't even look. He won't even look. The, the full time, however many times the woman came, served the food, went, he didn't even raise his head from the ground to look at her. While even the other Molana might have got, even other Molana might have looked once. I'm not saying he looked awkwardly. He might have looked once. And he saw that he made the comment, but Ustaji Rahimullah said, he said, I never looked to see how her eyes were, face were, I didn't even look. Now this other story I'm telling you of his own house in Pitt Street, there's a couple of people coming, and Ahmed Ali, his son, is in the house, Mawlana Fadrin Sahib is in the house, and there's hardly any food. Nothing's cooked, and they're coming right now, they're coming within minutes. So Mawlana Fadrin Sahib turned around to his son, he said, Ahmed, he said, quickly, we need to serve them some food. So Ahmed said, he said, Dad, there's no food. He said, there must be food. He said, there's hardly any food. So what is there? He said, there's a bit of chicken, a little bit of chicken. And he said, there's only a couple, literally two or three rotis, that's it. And they're coming right now. One of us inside, he said, oh, he said put the, put the uh, pot on the, on the cooker. He said, don't lift the lid up. Don't lift the lid up. So... His son is here in front of me. He didn't lift the lid up. They put it under the cooker. And they only had two or three rotis. They did not make any fresh rotis, nothing. Okay? So the guests came. And Monana was the first one to lift the pot up. And when he lifted it, he said, Bismillah. And then he put his own hand in there. And he took out chicken for this one, chicken for that one, chicken for this one. And then he, the roti, again, he put his hand into the container. He would take it out. Break it up and give this one quarter, this one quarter, this one quarter, that one quarter. Kept on, he would eat himself. Ahmad was eating and gave a carry on, gave more chicken to this one, more chicken. There's only a few key pieces, only two, three pieces. But he kept on taking chicken out, taking chicken out, taking more roti out, more roti, out, more roti out. Everyone was full. And there was still some left over. This is from the karama of the awliya. This is from what Allah Azza wa Jal gives from the karama of the awliya. Now, if you don't believe this here, yeah, that's you because when you spend time with Ustadi, if you spend time with him, then you would realize how he was. Because Ustadi, Rahimullah, I used to go to his room and when he opened up to me, I started to realize this is no ordinary man. And I'm not just saying this. Today on the way here, I phoned Sheikh Naeem uh, from Oxford, who was the, who was the, uh, the nephew of Ustadi. Okay? Sheikh Naeem. He was in Bradford first, then he went to Southampton, he's in Oxford right now. Sheikh Naim had a good conversation with him on the, on the way. And one of the things he said, I said to him, Sheikh, I said, I'm going and I'm going to talk about Ustadji in Oldham in Pitt Street in his masjid. And Sheikh Naim, I, I said to him, please, Sheikh, I said, tell me something that I can say. He said, one thing he said, which is in my heart as well. He said, this was no ordinary man. He said, we in the family, we have a, you know, sometimes you have a little bit of a, a dispute amongst us. He said, our dispute is who, who is that, like, who is the person in the family who says that Ustadji is not close to him? He says, everyone says he's close to him. In fact, he was telling me, he said that his sister is married to one of Ustadji's sons. And he says, she's like a bahu, like a daughter-in-law to him. Even she says, who's not close to Mamu? Who's not close to to uncle. Everyone felt that they were closest to uncle. And this is in his family, he said, whether it's in the family, in the mothers. And I want to tell you this. My father, Rahimahullah, was a person who was a bit, you know, he was a bit more on the tough side. Okay? He was a bit more on the tough side. And I really give him a lot of du'as, a lot of du'as, because if it wasn't for my father, I don't think I'd be straight. I needed the beats, you know what I'm trying to say, like, yeah? I, I needed them, okay? But I didn't have that father figure. You know, you need a father to, t to teach you manners, to teach you other, to have a close relationship with you. You need that. I never got that because when I went to Madrasa, I was just with Ustad from the age of 14. Before the age of 14, my father was, was very much like, you know, he kept his distance from us. So he never spent that one-to-one -one with, with us. I have to say this, and I'm not making this up. Ustad Ji Rahimahullah became like my father. And I will tell you this, if his son Ahmad was in the Madrasa, and I'm saying this in front of him in his masjid. If he was in the madrasa and I was in the madrasa at the same time, I would get no different treatment from his son. 
his son is nodding. I would get no different treatment because he actually treated my, me like a son. And this is a sign of a real teacher. And the way he treated me was like there was no different from a real son to what I was as a student. I mean, I've got no relationship with him whatsoever. I just came across his life. I just came across this person and he's, he's wonderful. Every day I'm getting things from him. And every day he never took anything from me. And he used to say to me, he used to say to me, Ajao, Ajao. He said, come here, come here, beto, beto, kalo, kalo. He said, eat, eat, eat. He said, eat from me. He, said, he used to say, Hassan, where are you going to find this food from? Because Alhamdulillah, you know, a lot of people used to give nice food, kebabs and, you know, this kind of Afghani kebabs and sheik kebabs. And all the time he used to come to his room, yeah? He used to feed, he used to give, and he used to give, and he used to give. And he used to say, Akka, he used to create me, he said, Akkal Agiya. Akkal means the big eater, is here. So I used to go, and mashallah, Mullah used to have lovely food in, the, in his room, and he used to give, and he used to say, he used to say to me, he said, can juice? <laughs> he used to say, you know, joking with me, he say, stingy? He says, you love, you love dishing out other people's food, don't you? Uh, so because I used to, I, you know, in the, in the, when you're sitting with them and you, you take his food and you give a bit to somebody else, and when I give it to somebody else, he says, de do unko, de do. Kisi oro ka jo maal hai, wo dene mein bohut khub lagta hai aapko. He said, when you give somebody else his food to somebody, you know, somebody else, he says, you're not giving your own food, are you? Right? But he used to say to me, you know, he used to be very, he used to joke around like this. And the best, you know, when you look at the hadith, kana mazahan, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to joke around with this, Make, make cracks to certain jokes that used to make you feel warm. You know, he's not really putting me down at all. I used to love when he used to do that with me. But the thing was, in his jokes, there were, there, there were lessons. In his jokes, there were lessons. I remember, subhanAllah, uh, once I was next to him and he gave me tea. Sheikh Naim was in front as well and we were drinking tea. And I, I drank my tea and I put it, put it cup down. And there's a little bit of, a little bit left. You know, at the bottom, the sugar is there. And you know, sometimes tea leaves are there, right? At the bottom, so you kind of leave that. So I left that. And Molana, subhanAllah, if you saw Molana eat food, forget not leaving anything. He was on another level. Okay, so he, he drank his tea and he used to drink all of it. And the last one was like, like that. Okay, and he used to put it down. So he finished his and he's looking at mine. I've left a little bit. And he said to me, he said, Hassan, he said, you know, what's the matter? Now I said, Mona, I said, I picked it up again, have a little bit, I don't want to have the sugar and you know, the little bit of tea leaves. And what he did is, in front of Sheikh name, he picked my cup up, took it, he drank it and put it down. And he said, don't leave anything. He said, if you leave anything in your cup, he says, it's a sign of kibber, it's a sign of arrogance. Now, you know, you have to just stay like that. But subhanAllah, he would say in a way sometimes, because I was close to him, he could say it like this. When he, would, when he would teach someone something, so this is how he, how he used to eat. Now imagine this, yeah? He's finished a chicken, a chicken leg piece or thigh or something like that. When he's finished it, when he's finished eating every single part of the chicken meat on the bone, he would take his pen knife out. Ustadji had a pen knife. I don't know how many of you sat with him to eat, yeah? He would take his pen knife out, he's open it up. He'd take the same bone and he would scrape the meat off the bone. The remaining minute pieces would scrape it and scrape it and scrape it all around. Whether, whatever piece he would scrape it and he would have every bit of it. And when you saw the bone that was left, the bone was absolutely without any meat. And he would leave it like that. He would not let any single piece of his food drop and be left or not be eaten, he would finish everything. And, you know, this, this is from his teachings uh, to us. Now, I'm going to go back to the other stories that I'm coming to, which was, you know, in the, I said to you in Pitt Street, he taught jinns and you're waiting for that one, right? Mehman used to come to his house. Guests used to come to his house. And, uh, you know, all the time guests used to come now and again. And always something is being given to the guests. And what happens is sometimes people come at odd times. Sometimes people come at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And just like Ahmed had to also take people out of the house. You know, like he's, a fa he's his father. He has to give him a rest as well. If, if the people never said they're going, Ustadji would never get them out of there. Now, this is what used to happen in Nottingham. In Nottingham, I used, to, I used to serve him breakfast in the morning. And then I used to return at 4 o'clock. And in the less, lesson time, I got a lot of time from him because he used to teach us. So I got the lesson time. Then I got the after breakfast time. 
Then I got the four o'clock to six o'clock time. You know, I used to really try and get benefit from that, and that's it. I'm done. Now, certain students used to go to his room at nine o'clock in the night, and they used to go inside the room, and Monana would take his peanuts out, he takes his badams out, he takes his whatever he has, and they're having a party in there. You know, like they're eating and they're t asking Monana questions. Now, some of the questions they used to ask was wasting his time. Some of the questions, honestly, they're, they're nothing of their benefit. They just ask him about this, ask him about that. And the thing is, Monana never, ever put anyone down, not a single of those students. Whatever they asked him, he would engage with them and he would talk, talk to them. And that's how he made his mahabba and his love. And that's how he made them be people who wanted to love Islam, wanted to love the Quran. That's how he got them. So sometimes up to the 11 o'clock day in, the, in his room, I used to go up to 11 o'clock, knock on the door. There's about seven of them inside there. I used to go in. And Monana would never tell anyone to leave. I said, guys, get up. I used to be the, you know, the Umar, yeah? I had to go in, guys, get up, I'm sorry. 11 o'clock, Mona has to go to sleep because 2 o'clock is up for Tahajjud. There's no compromise on that. If Mona, Rahimullah, slept at 11, he's up at 2. If he slept at 12, he's up at 2. If he slept at 1 o'clock, he's up at 2, and there's no other resting time, only in the daytime, he would sleep 10 to 15 minutes just before Zohar Salah. So practically, he's living off sleep sometimes four hours a day, sometimes three hours a day, sometimes two hours a day, sometimes one hour a day. And I had to take those students out, but Morana would never say no to them to go out of, his, out of his room. And in that time, subhanallah, he's spending time with them, whatever they wanted. Sometimes even, Morana would get into a wrestling match with them. You might think, what? Yes, there's one student, I said this in one of my bands before, but I'll just say it as quickly as a thing, recap that. There's one student that, all the teachers said, throw him out. And Monana Rahimullah he said, no, he said, don't throw him out. He said, I'll take him in my service. And Monana took him in his service. This was, this guy was wild. About seven of us used to beat him up, and he still he could nothing happens to him. Okay? Seven of us beat him, nothing happens to him. And he was doing all these other you know, things in the mother's side, which the Ustad said, all the teachers said, get him out. Monana alone said, listen, no. He said, I will look after him, and he took him in his service. And then Monana started to work on him. How did he work on him? He saw that, you know, he's a strong guy, right? He's a strong guy. So Monana said, he said, Monana's 70 years old now. This kid is 19 years old. 19 or 18 years old. And I'm not going to give you the name for the, for the sake of it, but I'll tell you this. Monana said to the child, he said, he said, you're strong, huh? He said, yeah, I'm strong. He said, you couldn't beat me. This is, this is Mona Fadranjara. He said, you can't beat me. He said, in what? He said, in wrestling. He said, he said, he laughed. He laughed. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I'll take you on. 70 year old man. Who's not going to take a 70 year old man on? He said, I'll take you on. He said, come on, let's, let's start. So Monana in his room, six by six, he's having a wrestling match. And then what happens? You're expecting, right? Mona Fadranjara is going to be knocked on the ground, right? No. Mona Fadranjara put him on the ground. He was strong, my God, he was strong. And then he got him on the ground and then the student said, he said, look, he said, look, give me another chance. Give me another chance. So Mona said, okay, stand up again. Let's go again. So they went again, Mona got him on the ground again. Mona not only got him on the ground, Mona put him in a position that the 18-year-old strong, strong kid couldn't even move. And Mona said to him, he said, hey, what happened? Huh? He said, what He said, you're strong? You're strong? Now through this, he created a friendship. This is, you've got to think what he's doing. He's not just wasting his time. He never did this with any other student. He was looking for a way to get this student into, <clears throat> into the studies for him to love to study uh, the, the, the course that is in the madrasa. So now this kid, know how embarrassed this, this uh, student was, this teenager was. How embarrassed a 70 year old man put him on the floor. Right? Who's he going to say this to? So he became like a little bit of a mouse in front of him. So Mona said, he said, look, I know, I know things that you don't know. So then they start talking, talking. And Mona found out that he likes poetry. So Mona engaged him in poetry more and more until every day the student used to come and learn poetry of him. And through that, Mona taught him the religion. And through that, Mona made him, subhanAllah, that, that teenager who all the teachers were going to throw out, today he's an imam of his own right. And it's only because of Ustaji that that person became an imam. Otherwise, he was going out of the madrasa. All teachers were ready to throw him out of the madrasa. 
This is the level of tarbiyah. And if I tell you, subhanAllah, let me go back to that. Again, I'm drifting off. Right? You want to hear that story? Pitt Street, the jinn. Right? <laughs> okay. Ahmed told me this. That at 11 o'clock, you know, okay, he's, he's getting people out of the house. And what happens is, what, some nights, what happens? This happened more than one night. He wakes up 1 o'clock in the night. And in his father's room, his father is talking to somebody. Upstairs in the bedroom. So Ahmed, his son, gets up. And he goes to the, to the room, and who's talking? I mean, one o'clock in the night, right? He knocks on the door, and he, he goes into his father's room. His father, Ustad, is, is sitting on one side of the bed. In front of him is a pillow. On the pillow is Sahih Bukhari, okay, facing him. In front of him is another pillow on the bed, on the same bed. On that bed is a Bukhari facing the other way around. And in that place is no one. So Ahmed says, says dad, 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 I've been hearing that you're talking. Who are you talking to? Ustadji says, no, no, he said, you might have heard a few things, whatever you had, go back to sleep. Don't worry, there's no one here. Many occasions he walked in that room and he saw his father like that with Bukhari towards him, Bukhari towards the other way, and there's no one sitting there. Basically, he was teaching a jinn and he was giving him lessons from Sahih Bukhari. This was, this was your Ustadji, which most of you never knew. And even I wouldn't have known, known this thing. But when you spend close time with him, then you realize that this is no, no, no normal man. You know why? Because he said to me this. Because when you get close to him, he brings things out. <laughs> if you weren't close to him, you'd never say any of this. And I can only say this now because he's gone away. If I ever said this and he was still alive, oh my God. Was, he would have got so angry with me. So once he said to me, he said, Hassan, he said, I know an ayah in the Quran. If I read it, then I can open any lock I want. He said, I know an ayah in the Quran. If I read it, any lock, locked, completely locked. If I want to open the door or the lock, I can open it. I was amazed at this. I asked him for the ayah. He wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> I was too young, right? He wouldn't give it to me. Then he said to him another day, he said, Hassan, he said, I know an ayah in the Quran. If I read it, I can become invisible. I'm not making this up. Now again, you might say, well, where is that in the sunnah? They said, no, look, look. Certain waliyas of Allah, they get close to Allah. Allah puts something in their heart. They know what to read. They read it and Allah just inspires them. This is from the mujarrabat. This is from their experience. Okay? This, is, this doesn't have to be direct from the Quran and sunnah. Allah gives it to whoever he wants. He wants. And he said this, he said, I know an ayah in the Quran, if I read it, I can become invisible. I said, Sheikh, what's that ayah? He said, where do you want to go? Huh? And he wouldn't give me the ayah. So then I started to think to myself, mm, I, need, I need a good way, I need a good reason to get the ayah. I said, Sheikh, I said, there's a lot of, lot of things going on in the world, you know. And if I had that ayah, he said, where would you go? I said, oh, well, I could go to certain, you know, secret services. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could go inside there, start seeing what they're planning, what they're doing. And he said to me, he said, Hassan, if you got that ayah and you went to the secret services place, invisible, went inside there and you saw what they wrote. He said, what are you going to do after that? He said, I'll listen now. He said, what are you going to do after that? And then he would go into a whole discussion of, look, Whatever Allah Azza wa Jal has planned, Allah, that's going to happen anyway. We are only a means on the earth. We have our will, Allah has his will. And when the two wills clash together, Allah's will cuts the human's will. And he was a very strong believer of this will of that you do what you want, but Allah Azza wa Jal, when his will clashes, clashes with your will, his is going to cut you and whatever he wants will happen. But you're supposed to still do whatever you want to do. Through that, he would say that he would say the quotations of Ali radiallahu anhu. That Araftu Rabbi bi fasli awazim. Ali radiallahu anhu would say that I recognize my Lord by the times that I made an intention and Allah wanted something different and whatever Allah wanted happened. When he cut my determinations, that's when I found out that Allah is the one who's in control. And then he would talk often about his, his sheikh, his biggest sheikh in his life was Sheikh Hussein Ahmad Madani Rahimullah. Okay, from Deoband. He graduated from Deoband in 1949. 
Okay, Mullah Fazlul Nisab, he graduated from Durban in 1949. And he would often speak about Durban uh, to me, to, to us. And he, he said there was no other teacher that was on the level of Hazrat Hussein Ahmad Madini Rahimahullah. And by speaking about that, what he said is that, he said, what Allah gave Shaykh Hussein Ahmad Madini Rahimahullah, he said, nobody else had. He said, he, I used to ask myself, Hazrat, how are you sleeping just three hours, two hours in there? He said, that's nothing. He said, my Ustad, my Sheikh, Hazrat Hussein Ahmad Madin Rahimullah used to sleep one hour a day. Every day, one hour. He said, sometimes when he wouldn't be able to sleep one hour a day, in the daytime he used to sit down like this and he used to doze off a little bit, just for a few seconds. And he would get up and he would say, Mujhe bohot neend aati hai, mujhe bohot neend aati hai. Lord, I get very, very sleepy, I get very, very sleepy. He said, I've had a very good sleep. And he said he would get up and on another 24 hours without sleeping. And I used to be amazed. How are they doing this? He said, subhanallah. Sheikh Hussein Ahmad Mandin, when he would speak about him, he would speak very highly of him. That sometimes because of his political you know, uh, you know, a contribution that he had that time in India, because they were trying to keep India as one. His thing was to keep India as one. And if you know about Maulana Thanwi, rahimahullah, his thing was to have the formation of Pakistan or the, have a formation of a different land, a Muslim land. So they had the differences. Both of them are buzugs in their own right. Both of them are the wali of Allah in their own right. But they had this big difference. And he said to me, he said, and this is from his teaching. He said, once, Sheikh Hussein Ahmad Madani, rahimullah, he, at Fajr time, because he used to pray tahajjud, and he used to, he used to read one juz of the Quran in his tahajjud. And then after that, in the morning, he, he called a couple of his disciples, and he said to them, he said, you know what? He said, Pakistan is going to happen. As in the land the Muslims wanted is going to happen. And Mulana Hussein Ahmad Badani was, was really working to keep India as one without it splitting into Pakistan or whatever other land is going to split into. Now his disciples said, this was in 1946 he said this. 1946 he said this. 1947 is the formation of Pakistan. These disciples said, he said, Hazrat, you know, how is this? And, and then Maulana, Maulana Hussein Ahmad Madani said, he said, he said, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, because Allah, Allah puts ilham, what we call ilham. Sometimes he puts a thought in the heart, very strong thought that is going to happen. And this is from the awliya of Allah, this happens with them. He said, I have felt this morning after my dua that Allah is going to allow this new land to happen. His disciples said, but Hazrat, he said, so do we stop our campaign now? He said, no, we don't stop our campaign. His disciples said, why? If you know from something that you've received from Allah Azza wa Jal that this new land is going to take place, then shouldn't we give up our campaign and, and do something different? He said, no. He said, the human has to do what the human is seeing on the earth, but whatever Allah will will, will happen anyway. And this is from the teachings of Mawlana Fadr himself. That you do your best of what you want to do, but Allah brings his cause in place and he goes against yours, it's going to happen anyway, but you've got your intention of doing whatever good it is, just go according to what you see. On the way here today, I was talking to Monana Omar Abdul Razak. Okay? He's from Leicester. He spent a lot of years with, with Sheikh after we graduated in 1997. He probably spent the last 18 years okay, of Hazrat's life. He spent with Monana. He was traveling with him, went to Umrah with him, went even to Pakistan with him, took him to Kenya several times, made him come to Leicester, and he stayed there. He spent a lot of time. So I was on the phone to him on the way here. I said, tell me something you remember about Hazrat. He said, one thing was, subhanAllah, he said that Monana would teach you, he would say to you, make mashwara with your, with your elders. Have consultation with your elders on the one side. At the second time, he would say, do istikhara with Allah Azza wa Jal, pray you two rakats of istikhara. But he said, when you've done istikhara and Allah's put into your heart to do something and your mashwara, your consultation said, do something. He said, go ahead with it. Whether it goes against you or whether it's for you, don't worry about it, just go ahead with it. Why? He said, if your istikhara works and the mashwara or your consultation was in that direction to go that direction and you went in there, even if you have a bit of a storm coming your way, he said, don't worry, Allah will make it be better in the end anyway. And these were from the teachings of Mawlana because he used to give a lot of good advice. Subhanallah, he was, he was even in philosophy, subhanallah, in philosophy, you would not be able to beat him in the, in the debates that he would come out with in philosophy. 
philosophy, like I said earlier, psychology, sociology, human beings, their behavior, all that. Monana was a, was, a, was a great master of that. And I told you earlier in the talk, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to get inside these remaining parts. But Monana was, was a great person who would be able to read people and know how they wanted to be treated and he would treat them according to what they wanted to be treated. This was a very deep thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had. Which is you meet someone, you know how they want to be treated and you treat them how they like, you, like themselves to be treated. And he used to say to me, subhanallah, never judge a person. Let me give you from his talim, from his education where I learned. Once I was in his room, and a person came in clean shaven, complete clean shaven, comes in, you know, stocky person, 40 years old. And he came in and he said, salam to Hazrat. Hazrat got up just like he gets up for everybody else. He got up, he hugged him, he embraced him, he gave him a few duas, he had his cheerful face, he spoke to him nicely, he made his cups of tea for him, for himself. He sat down, I was there all the while, half an hour he spoke to the individual, he answered all his questions, he spoke to him very well and he met him to the door. As he left, he left, Ustadji closed the door, he sat with me and then he said this to me. He said, Hassan, he said, do you know that this individual who just came in now, he said, Unke muse sharab ki bu areti. He said, from his mouth, I could smell alcohol. I could smell that he had a good few drinks and he came. I was surprised. What? You're hugging this man. You're treating him just like everybody else. You've treated him no different than anybody else. And I was surprised. And he said to me, he said, Hassan, he said, listen and learn. He said, never judge a person by their beard. He said, there's beard, there's no beard. He said, that does not tell you who has taqwa of Allah, who fears Allah, who doesn't fear Allah. That does not tell you that. Never judge a woman for her hijab. She wears a hijab, not wears a hijab. That doesn't tell you about her taqwa. Yes, she should wear hijab, fine. But that does not tell you about her fear of God. He said the fear of God is not in the clothes, it's not in the appearance. The appearance we do for a sunnah of the Prophet, fine. That is in its own sense. We do that. That's a reward. And that's something you do, you should do and so on, the way you dress and so on. But he said that does not say it. He said, you know this person? Unki Musa, he said, from his mouth, I could smell alcohol. But he said, Hassan, he said, his heart was so clean. La ilaha illallah. He said, his heart was more clean than some others who come with big beards to me. And now listen to this. I'm not, I'm not putting down. Look, I've got a beard as well. So many of you got a beard as well. We're not putting it down. But you've got to understand what he taught me. He said, don't judge people by their appearance. He said he's got a lot of love of Allah in his heart. His heart is so clean. He's fearful of Allah. Though he's drinking, he's fearful of Allah. Then he told me a story. He said in Pakistan where he used to teach in the school. He used to cycle it every day. And he told me another story by the way. And so many things are coming to my head. I ain't got time to finish this today. <laughs> he said there was one man who used to teach in his school. He's 55 years old. How old? Guys, tell me how old? I stayed there, say 55, say it. He said at 55 years of age, he used, to be, he used to be a colleague of his, both of them used to go to school and teach. 55 years of age, that old man said to himself, he's going he's gonna to try and do hifz of the Quran. He's going to try and memorize the Quran. So every day he used to memorize one ruku at home, and that one ruku, as he's cycling, he used to cycle, Mulana used to cycle as well. That person, that old man used to, used to go over his learn part on his cycle all the way till he reached the school. He said, in seven years, every day, one ruku, two rukus, three rukus, four rukus, like that, and every day his revision was on the cycle. He said, in seven years, at the age of 62, that man became half of the Qur'an. Half of the Qur'an. Anyway, he's now telling me a story about another person in the, in the, in the um, school. He said, in the school, he said, Hassan... He said, don't judge anyone by their beard, whether they have the beard or not. Yes, it's good if they have the beard, but he said, don't judge them by that. Harek se milna hai. Hame harek se milna hai. Harek se jordna hai. He would say, we want, we've got to meet everybody, and we've got, to, we've got to, you know, be united with everybody. And then he said to me, he said, in that school in Pakistan, he said, there was a young 18-year-old um, new teacher. 
He said, this 18 year old, he said, if you looked at him, he was like someone from a magazine. You know, you get these celebrity, you know, you get this, you know, the face is just like a, like a designer face. He said the girls in the school, in the college, they were crazy for him. They were like all over him. They wanted him. And you know him? He said, Hassan, he said, Usne kabi ek din padharata, when he used to teach, he said, not one day did he used to look at those girls. And he was clean shaven. Clean shaven, 18 years old, beautiful face. Girls are throwing themselves at him because he wouldn't even look at them. And he said, do you know Hassan? He said he was hafiz of 10,000 ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 10,000 ahadith that man knew from his heart. He said, don't judge anyone from the outside. You don't know whose heart has what taqwa. He said, taqwa is in the heart. Fear of Allah is in the heart. It's not on the appearance. These are the teachings that I would get from him. Sometimes we used to walk around in the neighborhood. And I would tell you one thing that, subhanAllah, he would never ever cry. You know this thing about crying in dua, crying in salat? No, never, not in front of anybody. Not in front of anybody. I, I begged him to join him for tahajjud. He said, when I first joined, I said, Mawlana, please, I want to join you for tahajjud. He said, no. He said, I don't want anyone to join me. So I begged him and I begged him and I begged him. And in the end, he said, okay, I'm going to allow you. So for about 20 nights, he allowed me to join him. And I was so excited. But you know me, I was a very heavy sleeper. He came and he used to wake me and he used to drag me up. Sometimes he'd pull me all the way up and I'd go all the way back down. But Monana carried on, you know, with his best way. He pulled me up. He got me and said, Hassan, Abu Dukallo, Jakar Abu Dukallo, make your wudu. I made my wudu. I'm so excited. I'm going to go and pray tahajjud with him. So I went in his room and, you know, two o'clock he used to get up. And I, was, I used to say, how, Monana, how do you get up? No alarm clock, two o'clock. How do you get up every night? He said to me, this is the trick. You ready for this? Now, you guys don't want to hear this, do you? You guys want your salad and roti after this, right? You want to get going, yeah? Taking all this time talking about Ustaji. He said to me, he said, when you go to bed, he said, sit up on your bed. And this is from his Mujarrabah. This is th these are things that they've experienced, okay? You're not going to find it in the Quran Sunnah. Sometimes you come across things that you experience. It's fine. If it works for you, just do it. You can't call it sunnah, you can't call it from the religion, but if it works for you, just do it. So he said, sit on your bed. He said, close your eyes and read, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr, surah. Yeah, Laylatul Qadr, khayrun min al-fishat, is a surah. He said, read it with your eyes closed all the way you come to, hatta matla'il fajr. And he said, when he said fajr, he said, open your eyes and think of the time you want to wake up. He said, then close your eyes again, read Inna Anzalna Fi Laylatul Qadr all the way to the end, Hatta Matla Al Fajr. Open your eyes and think of the time you want to get up. And he said, do it three times. When you do it three times, you go to Allahumma Bismillah, go to sleep. The time you want to get up, exactly that time you will get up. If it's 3.02, you'll get up at 3.02. Serious, I've tried this. It's weird. But he said this. He said, Hassan, Allah Ta'ala, Neend Utha Dega, Tumse Cheen Lega. He said, Allah will take the sleep from you, but only for a few seconds. If you wake up in the night, five seconds, you're fully awake. If you jump up that time, then, you, then you've made it. If you stay there, your full sleep will come back to you. And that's how he used to get up at two o'clock in the night. And when he would get up, subhanAllah, he would do his wudu. Okay, he woke me up. I went and we went to his room. And um, he said, okay, let's pray tahajjud together. So he made me lead. So I led. And after that, he said, Hassan, he said, now, let me teach you how, how, how I pray. He said, come behind me and read. So he started. And when he started, you know, he wasn't a full half of the Quran, but he, know, he knew many parts of the Quran he could recite. Off by heart. So we're in the dark. And when he prayed tahajjud, subhanAllah, full pitch, dark, dark, dark. All right. So I'm behind him. And this is from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he allowed Abdullah bin Abbas to join him in salah. And later on, I found out in Sahih Bukhari, he had a group of uh, youngsters that came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa and he allowed them to pray tahajjud with him for 20 nights. And subhanallah, Mawlana Fadri Sahib allowed me 20 nights, more or less roughly, to join him. After that, he said, no more. After no, I couldn't understand why, but I understood when I came to Bukhari and read the hadith. So what he did is he allowed me to stand behind him. He said, 
میرے پیچھے کھڑا ہو جاؤ اس ریڈی تیار ہو اس فائن اینڈ آئی اسٹارٹ اٹ نہ سر اللہ اکبر اسٹارٹ اٹ اسٹارٹ اٹ ریڈ اینڈ اس از نفل صلاح سو یو کین ریڈ اٹ بی لاؤڈلی سو از ریڈنگ اری فلامیم ہی گوز ٹو سم پارٹ آف دا فرسٹ جوز لانگ رکاٹ اینڈ از اے گڈ لانگ رکاٹ آئی ڈون نو مے بی کوڈ بی اباؤٹ ہاف این آور اسٹینڈنگ ہی اوکے ٹوینٹی منٹس ہاف این آور آئی ڈونٹ نو سو دین ہی گوز ان ٹو رکو وین یو ان ٹو رکو I am not joking. This is, this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he used to do his tahajjud, all right? When he goes into ruku, however long he stood in his qiyam, that's how long he's doing ruku. So if he stood for 20 minutes, his ruku is 20 minutes. And I'm not joking. And this 70-year-old man, Ustadji, is comfortably doing his 20 minutes. Half an hour doing it. And me, my legs are shaking, all right? And in his ruku, he says, Subhan Rabbil Azim, Subhan Rabbil Azim, Subhan Rabbil Azim. After that, he starts du'as. Oh my God, the du'as. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrik wa shukrik wa husni ibadati. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala dini. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub, sarrif qalbi ila ta'atik. And all the ad'iyah or the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of the masnoon du'as, he was saying his ruku, some of them, then Samia Allah, my God, when he said Samia Allah, my back was like, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. So I stood up, and as I stood up next to him, then he, then he says, Samia Allah, liman hamida, rabbana lakal hamd. And then he would say, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan, fiyan, karyan, karyan, karyan. And then he would say, ya rabbal alamin, rabbal samawati wal ard, wa rabbal arsh al azim, wa rabbal... And he'll carry on, all Arabic and carry on, and I'm standing, standing there. Another 20 minutes he'd be standing. Du'as, du'as, du'as. And then, Allahu Akbar to sujood, in his sujood, subhanahu wa rabbi ala, subhanahu wa rabbi ala, subhanahu wa rabbi And then he starts du'as again. These are du'as. Of, 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 from, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam du'as and he would do another sort of 15, 20 minutes again and then he'd sit in between another 20 minutes again and then he'd go back inside sujood another one like that and get up again and another good rakat and then all that oh my god and this is just two rakats you probably spend a good hour hour and a half I don't know how long if each one was 15 minutes each section then all 15 minutes okay and by the time you've done two rakats with him you're like whoa Ugh. you know ah oh. You know, you're a young man. You're supposed to be 20 years old or 18, I don't know how old, 18, 19 hours. And he'd pray his, his eight rakats during the night. And after he would finish that, then he would do some dhikr, some dua. After he finishes dua, he would go to the fajr place and he would be in the f- front line. Most of his salahs, illa mashallah, most of his salahs was in the front line. Okay? Those of you who were with us in Nottingham, you knew that. And then after he finishes his fajr, he's go back, and then what he's doing? He does some zikr, then he takes a book out, the Lailul Khairat, which is full of durood, on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, salawat from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to finish one Dalailul Khairat every single morning. This is one hour of sending salutations on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that, he, I'm going to tell you something about the salutations in a bit, but after that he would, he would, um, he would uh, start looking at the books for the lesson, He would prepare for his lessons. Then 8 o'clock, he would teach all the way to 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, he comes to his room. He rests for about 10, 15 minutes. Then they bring him some lunch. He has his lunch. Uh, or some, Sorry, he brings his lunch first, has lunch, and then he rests for 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> then he would get ready for Dhuhr. He goes for Dhuhr, prays Dhuhr. Then he's teaching for another two hours till 3.30, 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock, I'm there. Somebody else is there. Mehman are coming. Guests are coming all the way to 6 o'clock. Six o'clock, he's sitting in his room again. He's now preparing for his next day lesson for two hours. Anyone came in that time, he would close his book straight away. The mehman or the guest, he would look at him. Eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, he would have his dinner, maghrib, isha, all that done. Then the students would come. All the way till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, when they literally had enough and they'd be kicked out of his room, he would go to sleep for two hours, back up again, two o'clock, no miss. Two o'clock, tahajjud. One morning, I went to his room. And I went for breakfast. And that's the only morning he wasn't cheerful. And I thought, something has happened today. You know, something happens to someone. Yes, he was happy with me, cheerful. But I could tell, something's wrong today. He's not as cheerful as he normally is. And I sat there and I said, Hazrat, I said, what, what has happened? And he had a very sad face. I said, what has happened, Hazrat? And then he opened up to me. You know what he said? He said, Hassan, in 
40 years. 40 years. How many? 40 years. The first time in my life I missed the Hajj. 40 years. First time in my life this morning I missed the Hajj. And then he told me, he said, it's because of the jinns and the shayateen in this area. Because a lot of, lot of you know, different jinns and shayateen. Because, you know, it was a very wild kind of area. And he said, and, and he related the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on one valley they came and he told Bilal radiallahu anhu to, to look where the sun is rising from so that they can tell them about Fajr. And they had a very heavy sleep there and they actually missed Fajr. So he narrated that story and he said, look, after 40 years, this has happened, it's because of the influence of the shayateen and so on. And Hazrat would, subhanallah al-azim, Hazrat would sit in his room and he would be able to tell me what's going on on the other side of the madrasa, he would tell me from where he is. And you might think this is crazy stuff. I'm telling you, I had had the experience with him several times because he opened up to me. And he said, Allah has made the whole madrasa to me like a little ball in front of my, my face. He said, whichever way I want to turn it, I can turn it. And I can see the kids running around in the west wing. How they're running, where they're running, what they're doing. He said, Allah shows me that from where I'm sitting here now. If kids were up to something in the madrasa, he would know this. And this, this is firasa. This is what Allah Azzawajal gives, gives you know, such people. And I want to say to you, um, subhanAllah, I'm running a bit like Hazrat. Is it okay? I'm not going to probably get invited here again. I know. That is... Okay, I'll just quickly try and wrap up. After I finished, uh, I, went to, I came to Pitt Street here. 1998. I came to Pitt Street. Ahmed was in Pakistan that time. It was only me and Mulan Fazim in the house. Ahmed, you don't know about this, yeah? Okay, I came to the house, only me and Mawlana Fazim Sahib. And I really wanted to, you know, give a kind of allegiance to him and say, please, Hazrat, become my murshid and someone who's going to guide me like, in the spirituality and so on. So I went, went to the house. And this is, this is the full night, okay? When I came to his house, Mawlana started to cook. He started to chop the onions. And I was going to get up chopped. He goes, nay, 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 nay. He said, beto. Mera Hassan, piyare beto. Sit down. I'm sitting here, this old man is chopping onions in front of me. He wouldn't let me, he wouldn't let me touch it. He would not let me touch it. Tomatoes, onions, whatever, he's chopping it, he's making the curry. And he had a very good way of making it. He said he left it on night, all night, five hours on slow cook. He was cooking it. That night we spent five hours talking. And we talked about everything, you name it. And I said, Hazrat, please, I want you to become like my spiritual guide. So I'm guide me. He said, Ne iska laik nahi hon. Because I don't have that position to do that. I was just talking to Sheikh Naim on the way here. Sheikh Naim said, Me to roya, itna roya. So I cried so much. He said, because I went to Hazrat, I said, please, hand to hand, please, give me, you know, make me your, 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 your little student in the spiritual path and guide me. And Hazrat, he said, I said, I'm not of that position. I'm not of that position. Go to somebody else, go to somebody else. I spent 24 hours, more than 24 hours in Pitt Street, begging him, literally begging him. He did not allow it. But the great thing about him was that he would give me good advice over the phone. He would still guide me. And I want to say two more things because I know time is up. I would have loved to say a lot more incidents. You know, I have to say some incidents, man. You're going to have to forgive me, yeah? Let me tell you about his akhlaq, how he taught, right? One day I came with the breakfast in his room. And as I came in his room, subhanAllah, I had a whole tray. Hot milk on there, you know, other things, biscuits, fruits, other things, eggs, whatever. And we used to have this uh, Khan Saab in the kitchen that used to make it. Remember the fellow? Khan Saab. Khan Saab, you couldn't talk to him properly. You just make it, give it to you, and you had to just take it. So I was balancing this, I mean, okay, all the way to his room. And it was a long walk to go all the way up the stairs to his room. Anyway, I made it there. I knocked on the door, and I realized he's praying Ishraq in his, in, his, in his room. So I just about opened the door with, you know, came inside with the tray. And as I'm putting it down, la ilaha illallah, I dropped the whole jug of hot milk hot pipe he made onto his carpet and Hazrat is in Salah he's praying his Salah Moana never twitched he just prayed his normal Salah and the whole hot milk fell on his rug and his carpet and I said Ya Allah I'm dead today today I'm fired <laughs> today I'm fired I was panicking I got some tissues I started to dab it on there and I didn't know what to do Moana finished his Salah 
And then he turned around and he said, Mere Pyare Hassan, kya ho gaya? Kya ho gaya? Just like this. Mere Pyare Hassan, kya ho gaya? Itne parashan kyu hoonte ho? Raji, idhar aao. He said, what's the matter? What's the matter? Why are you becoming so, so, you know, frustrated for? He said, come here. He said, betho. Betho. He made me sat on his bed. Betho. Aram se betho. Dekhiye, kuch nahi hua. Kya hua? Thoda sa dood hai. He said, nothing happened. It's only a bit of milk. Mein aapko tariqa sikhata hoon. Mere piyara hasan. Kuch nahi hua. Kuch nahi hua. He went, he got some water with another jug. And I was red in the face. I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? His home room's going to smell now. Okay? Because it's milk. So he, he put some water with a jug, he put it over there, over the part, and he's talking to him all the way. Hassan, perashan ho gaye? Perashan? Kyu? Kyu? Main tariqa sikata. Let me teach you how to do this. So he put water over there, he took a spoon, took a bowl, and he started to scrape it onto the, into the bowl. I got down, tried to do it. He said, Nene, Hassan, betho. Aram se, aram se. Kuch nahi karna. Koi fikr nahi. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he, and he did it once, scraped all up. Again, he, 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 he threw that. He got another one and it's another jug again, put it over and he scraped it again. Another jug, he scraped it again. After he finished, he dried it up and I'm sitting there just like, I, I don't know what, what to do. And then he just put his mat out like normal. He put the breakfast stuff on the, on the, on the mat, he made me sit down and he gave me a cup of tea and he said, Mere piyara Hassan, ab batao. You know, like, what can I do for you? Normal, not a single difference at all the way I would have ruined his carpet. Now I'm going to say a couple more incidents and I'm done. These are, subhanAllah, these are after his demise. Hazrat was Hazrat during his lifetime and I could have benefited more. I know that. May Allah, you know, when you, when you meet a wali like this, please just take, take every bit you can to take time of them. We never realized who he was. When he passed away, Rahimullah, you know, the day he passed away, before he passed away, he actually said to the people around him in Pakistan, he said, May jis din, he said, that day everything's going to be white. He said this a few times. Even when he was in hospital, he said, the day I go, there's going to, everything's going to be white. The day he passed away, from nowhere there was snow that fell in the, that part of Pakistan. There was snow everywhere. But it melted very quickly for them to take the janaza uh, to its right place. But he, he said that. He said, the day I go, everything's going to be white. Now, after he passed away this, I, alhamdulillah, saw him in my dream a few times. And I'm going to write to you two, two dreams that I've seen and inshallah then the adhan can happen and we finished, okay? And he told me this to tell people. That's why I want this to go in the camera. He came to me in my dream and he said, he said to me, he, he opened a part of the Quran. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَا سَابِقُونَ You'll find this in Surah Mu'minun. These are verses that say, those people who believe in their Lord, those people who do not commit shirk or any, any associate partners with their Lord, those people who give but they fear that they're going to have, their hearts fear they're going to return to Allah, they're the ones who move forward towards khair and towards goodness. He said, Hassan, he said, Hassan, give dars of this ayah, teach people this ayah, teach people, he's so happy, teach people this ayah. I, I phoned my sheikh in Bangladesh and I said to him, I said, what have I seen? He said, he said he's in a very good place and he's trying to say to you that this has been his outcome, that he's running to his Lord. Then I saw him again in my dream. And this was even more profound. The one I saw next was, subhanAllah, I actually had ta'aleem from him. He taught me something in my dream after his death, a teaching that I never found anywhere in the books. This tafsir, you can check any tafsir in the world, you will not find this. So Hazrat came in my dream and he said, Hassan, he said, Mumin perashan kabi ho jata hai. He said, Hassan, believer sometimes becomes a bit frustrated. He said, Hassan, the believer doesn't realize how Allah makes him grow slowly with his iman. He doesn't realize it, but if you were to look at it over time, you'd realize it. He said, let me teach you now. He, this is all in my dream. He said, look at the Qur'an. He opened the Qur'an. It was at the end of Surah, surah Fath, 48th Surah. Right at the end, you know, Muhammadur Rasulullah, walladhina uh, amanu ma'ahu ashiddaw ala al-kuffar ruhama. When you know that ayah, the last ayah of Surah Fath, check it out. So in there he said, you know, there, there is an example of, of the believer and how Allah grows a plant. 
أخرج شطأه فآزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على سوقه يعجب الزراع ليغيظ بهم الكفار. Now that ayah he said to me, look Hassan, in my dream he said, Hassan, come here. He said, take this, take this microscope. He gave me a microscope. All right. So he showed, he showed me the, the growing tree. He said, look through the microscope. And I looked through the microscope. And there were many layers of the, of the part of the tree growing, of the plant growing. He said, look, there are a hundred layers here, hundred layers. And I looked, there was like a hundred layers, green layers growing. But if you looked at the stem, it was on a small stem. But in the stem, when you look deeply, there are a hundred layers. He said, like this, Hassan, Allah takes the believer through life. And this ayah is saying that the believer doesn't realize how Allah grows the believer. But there are many layers within him that are growing. He thinks he's nowhere. But Allah is saying through this ayah that is making him stronger and stronger. Then he said to me, he said, he said to me, he said, Pure dunya ko ye tafsir batao Quran ka. He said, tell the world about the tafsir of this ayah. He said, teach them this tafsir that the believer is growing. Not for the believers to think that they are desperate in a situation and Allah is not with them. No, Allah is with them. He's making them grow. But they don't see how, how Allah is making them grow thicker and thicker. Anyway, uh, Jazakumullah khair. Uh, I've, I've said all that. We're going to have a muqtasad dua now, inshallah, for Mullah Fazin. So a very short one. We can, inshallah, and after the adhan, and you can have your food, inshallah. I've held, I've held you too long. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept this uh, from all of us. May Allah Azza wa Jal uh, benefit us from the legacy of Ustadji. And may Allah Azza wa Jal, like I said, give him the best abode in the next life. Let's make a quick dua. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa nana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. اللهم يا حنان يا منان يا بديع السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث Oh Allah, we ask you that you accept this gathering We ask you to you accept this masjid You accept all our worship We ask you to accept Ustadji And all the khidma, all the service he has done All the people he has helped All the services he has done in this world Oh Allah, accept them, forgive and overlook his sins And whatever he may have done wrong Oh Allah, I ask you, oh Allah, and we all ask you here that you give Ustadji the highest abode in Aliyin. That, that you make him be of the highest people in Aliyin. Oh Allah, we ask you to have mercy on his soul. We ask you to raise him on the day of judgment amongst the Nabiyyin, Siddiqin, Shuhada, Salihin. We ask you to make him come up his grave in Medina Munawwara next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa drinking from the kawthar, from the kawthar at the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We ask you to make him from those people who will go, who, who will go with an easy account on the day of judgment. O Allah, give his book in his right hand. And O Allah, take him with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba and the Anbiya towards Jannah. And not only Jannah, let him cross the bridge like lightning. And O Allah, let him go to the other side from the first of the first, Sabiqun and Awalun. And not only grant him Jannah, but O Allah, give him Jannah to Firdaus. And O Allah, O Allah, we ask you to make us, make us people who will benefit from his legacy. And O Allah, we ask you to create the likes of him and the better of him on this earth and create multiples of them on the earth. Now Allah, we ask oh Allah, all his family members, oh Allah, and all his loved ones and beloved people to also give, give them the same outcome in the Akhirah. And all of us, oh Allah, include us in this dua and make us have the best of the outcomes in the next world.